Good evening, good afternoon, and for many of you, good morning. It's our absolute pleasure to welcome back viewers from around the globe to the second session of Modus Academy's fall webinar series on innovative rehab technologies. My name is Taya, and with me today I have fellow Aussie Ash. We'll be hosting today's very exciting event. We're focusing on the journey our experts here today have traveled from their rehab technology research to starting their own business. Thank you, Taya. I'm really looking forward to hearing the success stories of our panel members. Without further delay, let us welcome our speakers. Joining us for this webinar, we have two Canadian-based academic entrepreneurs, Dr. Tony Ingram, who is at the beginning of his commercialization journey, and Professor Milos Popovic, who has an established global business in neurotechnology. We will hear a bit more about our speakers before each of their presentations, but first, some housekeeping. The Q&A discussion will be left until the end of the webinar. Please type any questions you have in the Q&A box throughout the session, and we will do our best to answer them live. So first up, we have Dr. Tony Ingram. He is the co-founder and CEO of Neuro Axum Neurotechnology. It's based in Halifax, uh, Nova Scotia, Canada. And he, Axum is developing um, patient usable neuroimaging technology for guiding stroke rehabilitation. And prior to Axon, Tony was a physical therapist in neuro rehab, and he completed his PhD in neuroscience. And prior to that was a co-founder of a, an award-winning dance company for youth outreach work, which is really inspiring. So through his uh, teaching of dance, physical therapy, and now Axon, Tony has always worked really hard to help people use their mind in order to move their bodies. So I shall now pass the floor to Dr. Ingram. Thanks, Tony. Thank you so much for that introduction. Taya, and um, thank you everybody for coming to this uh, webinar today. Happy to present and tell my story. Um, it's uh, the story is not over, as someone, as Ash said earlier, near the beginning of my journey. Um, but uh, several years in, and uh, now in the clinical study phase of developing a product, and so um, I've we've we've had um, lots of things go well and lots of things go not so well. Uh, and so I, I like to tell those type of stories, especially to people who are interested in getting into this industry, because I think some of my favorite things to hear when I hear other people speak is uh, their horror stories. <laughs> uh, and um, and and it, it's instructive in, in how to sort of get past these challenges, because there are always many, many challenges. So I'm going to go ahead and share screen. One second, let me start the presentation. And one second. There we go. So can I get a thumbs up from someone? Yeah, there you go. Okay, so this is this is uh, the presentation. So you know what this is about, um, sort of my journey from research um, to starting a business. My, my journey, I think um, the relevance of my background starts earlier than that. So I'll get right into it. So as uh, Taya said, um, my background is, my interest has always been in movement and particularly how the brain controls movement. So I used to run a dance company. So I did this sort of thing for fun uh, for many years. And then, um, um, you know, my favorite thing was just learning how to do new things and new movements and, and learn different types of dance. And so I started a dance company mainly for youth outreach, uh, teaching in high schools. Uh, and so we actually won a business award for this in our local city, uh, best new business of the year, <laughs> which always makes me laugh because I think because uh, no one got rich, um, but it was profitable, uh, which is which is which was fun. So that was my first entrepreneurial experience. Now, while I was uh, doing all of this, I was pursuing my degree in physical therapy and I started practicing. Um, so I entered um, um, physical therapy focused mostly in neuro neurological rehabilitation. Um, this would be, um, uh, you know, I'd say most of the people, most of the patients I saw were, were stroke survivors of stroke, but I saw a wide variety and both inpatient and outpatient. So I saw a good portion of their journey as well. And that was, of course, very inspiring, but it left me wishing I could maybe improve uh, rehab, rehab because the effects are fairly small and subtle. Unfortunately, it's really tough. So I wondered if I entered the research realm, uh, could I find ways of making it better? So I entered a, a PhD program. There I am. And this is a nice little uh, picture from a, a university magazine uh, of, of uh, my lab mates and the professor, Dr. Shambo. Um, so I, 
I uh, went back into research. And it was here that I met my co-founder. He's actually second on the right in this picture, Chris Friesen, uh, and another co-founder of ours. And we started this company. Um, so it really started, um, there's a few reasons I guess we started. So Chris, my co-founder, actually designed a brain-computer interface. It was using EEG. Um, and the way it would work is he, he developed this game. Um, and you had to learn a secret handshake. And that's what's on the lower left here. Uh, you had to learn a secret handshake. Now, this video would be black and white. And the greater your activation uh, of, of your uh, sensory motor region of your brain, uh, the more you could lateralize your activity, I should say, um, the, uh, the, the more this uh, black and white image would become saturated in color. Uh, and I thought this was really interesting and kind of fun. Uh, and he showed in his study that patients or, well, uh, healthy people were able to do this and improve their ability to lateralize with this game. Uh, and I thought, wow, that's that's really interesting. Meanwhile, I was studying a lot of the literature um, uh, uh, in this in this realm of neuroimaging and neuro rehab. And there were many, many interesting ideas for ways of applying neuroimaging to rehabilitation. And I won't get into the details because I don't want to make this a science presentation or a pitch for even a pitch for my company. Uh, but the bottom line is that what we found was there was really no good usable neuroimaging tools feasible for most rehabilitation settings, particularly in the home, which is a trend in rehabilitation. Most rehab uh, is happening in the homes. Um, so we decided, we zeroed in on a technology called functional near-infrared spectroscopy. So just a quick primer, so you understand some of the prototypes I show you later as part of our journey. Uh, but again, I'm, not, I'm going to resist making this a science presentation and keep it simple. So it's like a very, very advanced pulse oximeter um, in, in that it, uh, it, it has to be more powerful because it has to get through more layers of tissue to reach the cortex. And you have to do a lot to make sure you're not fooling yourself into measuring uh, other reasons uh, oxygenation can change, but that's what you measure. So if you place these sensors over the sensory motor cortex, you'll see um, during during a task, so in this case, movement in this diagram, so you use it using your hand in some way, you'll see a nice increase in oxygen uh, that's that if you have a good signal you can you can see with um, very little processing you can kind of eyeball it and so it's essentially a bold signal like fMRI and um, and then um, there are more interesting things once you get the signal so this is essentially brain activation and there's a whole bunch of ways you can operationalize that and then you can look at uh, patterns of activity between and, and, and the simplest way um, one of the very simple ways you can do this is through laterality um, so this is just the difference in brain activation between the two sides or a ratio. Uh, there's many ways to, again, to operationalize it. Um, but this, this is looking at the relationship between the two hemispheres. This is what is relevant in stroke rehabilitation uh, and a few other things. But this is one of the things you'll see in the literature a lot, particularly in fMRI, but also in NIRS. And so this is sort of what we wanted to get with our technology. And we wanted to make it really easy <laughs> uh, because I knew that it wouldn't really translate clinically unless it was. So this is the beginning of our prototyping journey. So I wanted to show you some pictures because this is the fun stuff. So here's our first prototype from tw uh, 2017. So it's just uh, some electronics on a breadboard um, and, and some components. And here are the sensors uh, on these little sticks of putty that we would stick to our heads uh, and, uh, and strap on and try to get it to stay on our head as, as best as we could. Uh, we could get a signal in the frontal cortex fairly easily, but but the, but the motor cortex was challenging. So our next prototype, we stuck it on a pair of headphones uh, to try to get it on the sensory motor cortex on the top. And our co-founder, Mike, pictured here, shaved his head for a couple of years uh, so that we could get a good signal. So that's dedication and you need dedicated co-founders. <laughs> and so he shaved his head, but we kept working toward getting it working through the hair. Uh, which was a huge challenge. Um, so, you know, our prototype became more sophisticated over time. And then we started thinking, all right, what do we want this to actually look like uh, eventually? So we started doing some industrial design and building models. And then the mission was essentially to take this working prototype and this looks like prototype and merge them. So, of course, it didn't end up looking like this. Um, so here's our first attempt at making it wireless and portable. Uh, still lots of wires, but a lot more custom components. And, and th this is around 2019. So all of that that I just showed you took two years. Uh, then in 2019 as well, we finally enclosed the system 
uh, we call this the spider um, uh, hat <laughs> because it had lots of articulating components that could sort of hug your head. Um, and so it still wasn't quite what we wanted it to be, but it was working. Uh, then we got get a little closer in closing the whole headset. Ty has seen this before, so this is familiar to her. Um, and, uh, you know, we still needed a lot of strapping and it was, of course, a lot bigger than we than we thought. Uh, and here's our current prototype that is now being used in uh, clinical pilots, uh, some early stage clinical trials. So it has a fitting system. You have to fit it to the person, but once it's fitted, they can put it on very quickly and off they go and start doing their exercises or their assessments or whatever it is you want to record brain activity during. Um, and so this was always our, our mission was to make it very usable, um, even if that meant meaning your signals had to be very simple. We wanted it to be really fast and very simple. So anyway, this is where it's at now. We're still iterating. We're still prototyping, even during these clinical pilots. Although we are targeting a design freeze uh, in February, so early next year, we think is we're, we're going to hit design freeze, and it'll be version one of the product finally after so 2017, five years. <laughs> so that so that was the fun stuff. Okay, that's prototyping and getting a device working and getting it out there in the real world, which I'm proud that it is. But then there's building a company. So this is a whole other challenge. Uh, it can be fun, but it's 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 a different kind of challenge. Uh, and uh, uh, and I think that when you start a company, most people are very excited about the device and the product and the invention that they're making, and they don't think enough about this. But as soon as you get out there and you need money to do this prototyping and hiring people and so on and so forth, you start to realize very quickly because no one will give you money unless you have a really good uh, a, a business plan of some sort. And so you start uh, hitting realities very quickly. So when you build a business plan, you know, you have to think about who's going to buy it. And you might think that's obvious, but it often isn't, especially in healthcare, who pays for things is often very, very much not obvious. Um, why would they buy it? Uh, you might think, oh, of course, they're going to buy it if we improve patient outcomes. But that's not always the case, unfortunately. How much are they going to pay for it? So valuing things, really difficult. You have to look at health economics and so on. Who's going to use it is not the same person, probably, who will purchase it. And why will they use it? How will they use it? How does it fit in the clinical workflows? Um, is it usable? How are you going to validate that it's usable? Because regulators will want to see that you did that. Uh, so you need to figure out a lot of stuff. Clinical workflows, you know, how do you fit this in the real world practice? Are people going to use it? Do they think you're a snake oil salesperson? Uh, you know, are you going to are you going to be accepted by the clinical community uh, and get uh, you know if your product requires um, 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 prescription? Uh, is anyone going to prescribe your device? <laughs> uh, market access, which is really key and the topic I believe of the next webinar, I think. And I, if you're interested in this field, I highly recommend you go to that webinar. Uh, so you got to figure out reimbursement and logistics. How do you get it out there again into the world and get it paid for? And it is, and this is very, very challenging. And I think this is where a lot of founders fall down because they don't think about it early enough. Um, and it's, uh, and, and you know, I think a lot of people who start companies think, uh, well, you know, I'll build the product, I'll do the clinical trials and show that it works, then I'll get regulatory clearance, and then I'll bring it to market. But you have to be thinking about all of these things in parallel and working toward all these things in parallel. You might think that because you can't sell it until you have regulatory clearance that there's no business development to do, but that's not true. Um, there's tons of market research to be doing. Um, and then you have to figure out regulations, of course. And then if you want to get capital and, and financing to build your company, you better figure out market sizing and, and be able to make a compelling argument that your company someday could be big <laughs> and an investor would be interested in this. So, uh, and grants think the same way. You might think that grants are different, but they think the same way as investors many times and in, in when they are uh, vetting companies to give money to. And then of course, you're gonna have competition. Um, and sometimes competition, you may be very innovative, but the real competition in many cases is the current standard of care and the way things are currently done. And so you're still gonna be competing against that because people don't like to change. Um, and, and that's just how it is. You have to have a really compelling um, motivation. And then you're gonna iterate on this because all of your assumptions about these things on the left, <laughs> once you go out and start learning these things, 
probably you're going to find out that you're wrong, uh, wrong about a lot of things, and then you're going to iterate. Um, so how do you do this? So uh, the, the approach we took, a lot of you may have already heard of this, is the, the sort of customer discovery process. You get out there and you talk to who you think your customer is going to be and your users, and you pitch them your idea and you get their feedback and you gauge their excitement. You try to understand uh, whether they would actually use this and buy this someday. Um, and then, chan and, and it's all hypothetical until money actually changes hands. So I would say that even at this stage of our company, we are not beyond the customer validation stage. And we have pivoted at least three times <laughs> uh, at, at, with respect to our business model, but even major aspects of our product. Um, so the core technology hasn't changed over the years, but our idea of the full product, including the software and how we deploy it, um, and it's certainly the business model has changed drastically numerous times. Um, so to do this, you know, when I started out, you all heard my background. I was a physical therapist and an academic, and I was not a business person except for the dance company, but it's not the same. <laughs> it was not very relevant of the experience. Uh, uh, maybe the only thing that I learned was how to be tenacious uh, and persistent. But other than that, uh, it wasn't all that relevant. So you have to go out and get help. So one second, I need to take a drink. So getting help, uh, uh, you know, network, try to find people. If you know other entrepreneurs, if you know people in the industry, talk to them. If you don't know anybody like this, look for uh, programs like Modus Academy or other, you know, local startup scenes and things like that and meet people. Then you're going to be probably going after grants. Unfortunately, a lot of grants require you to also have private financing like investors on board and they'll match funding. Uh, I actually think this is a big problem and someday I'd like to get involved in trying to change this <laughs> uh, because investors are very different. They have timelines that grants do not. Um, so you also check out accelerators, but make sure you're wary of what kind of accelerator you're going to. Many times they invest in you, but they take equity. Uh, it's usually a good deal for them. In this case, we went to Hacks, which is a hardware accelerator, which we found excellent for teaching us how to prototype quickly. And we actually lived in China, Shenzhen, China for a while. Um, uh, learning all this stuff, working with suppliers, distributors, and manufacturers. And it was a great experience, but they couldn't really help us on the medical stuff, like regulations and reimbursement. So more accelerators. I went to uh, Texas Medical Center Accelerator down in Houston, Texas. Uh, and I did another thing in Canada called Creative Destruction Lab. And uh, so you get out there. Again, you get out there and you try to find advice. And then finally, you'll land investors. And good investors should also be uh, experts in your your sort of industry and be able to help you. And then you have to build a team. I'm conscious of time. Let me know if I'm going over time here, uh, Taya. Um, so, uh, so, you know, you have to build a team. Again, I was a physical therapist and an academic, not an engineer, and we needed to build hardware. So I had to hire great engineers. How do you afford this? You need money. You have to really be careful with intellectual property so your, and your employment agreements. And then you have to retain people and keep them happy. Uh, which again is tough, um, especially in this market. Um, um, and, uh, you know, when do you bring business people on board? Uh, it's probably going to be you, whether you like it or not, and whether you are a business person or not. So I had to fall into this role, uh, but you can work with consultants. And when do you bring in sales and marketing? Uh, that's a really good question. We have no sales and marketing people yet. Um, I tend to work mostly with consultants because we're just not there yet. Um, and then you have to think about who you're going to partner with and build credibility with, frankly. So clinical trials, designing them, budgeting them, getting them done. So you might try to keep your budget light, but chances are it's not going to get done. <laughs> your recruitment rates and your patients going to be very slow uh, and so on and so forth. So, you know, skimping on budget and clinical trials is not always a good idea. What aspects of company development are you going to outsource? It's very expensive. Um, and you better watch timelines because consultants tend to burn money and not get back to you the same way an employee would. So we prefer to build uh, uh, in t uh, to have things in house as much as possible. That's just our preference because it allows us to sort of see what's going on a little more closely. Um, but that's a matter of preference, and you have to think hard about that. And then, are there any strategic partners that you can have? We don't have really any at the moment, um, but we think about it a lot um, because it could be very beneficial. So I want to finish uh, because I, I may be going over time. So I'm going to finish with some closing advice. Here's my two cents uh, based on my experience thus far, but I'm not done learning either. So 
everyone will tell you to do something you're interested in. And that's true. But I think you should also do things that you're, that leverage your strengths because you, things are going to, to go wrong very often. Uh, and your confidence is going to waver, but persistence is key. So doing something that makes you feel like you're good at it, uh, or making sure at least part of your role, maybe not everything you do, but at least part of your role is something that you are good at and you can feel confident in doing is really, really helpful uh, for getting past those difficult moments. Uh, it, also lever it also plays into recognizing your strengths, plays into how you build your team and how you bring on other skill sets into your team and build a good team around yourself. Um, startups don't think enough about market access in the early days. I believe this very strongly. And I think this is a hot take, but I think that uh, startups think way too much about regulations in the early days. because, And I think that this can hurt you in a few ways because the temptation is there to take the easiest regulatory pathway you can get and get to market quickly. But that is not always good because you often limit the scope of your product. You often limit the marketing claims that you can say, and you can't differentiate yourself very well from your competition. Um, so taking a really quick path to market um, may jeopardize your commercialization potential. So I, I warn people, it's still important and you still have to think a lot about it and do a lot of work. And we've done several meetings with FDA, pre-submission meetings and so on. You have to do the work, but I think people too often let regulations lead them to uh, through their product development. And it should be the other way around. Regulations are what they are. They're a hoop you have to go through to sell your product um, at, for good reasons, but you know you should build the product you need to build to commercialize it and then get it, and then it has to be regulated however it has to be regulated. Find smart investors. If, uh, uh, if you don't, it will haunt you. And uh, I speak from experience here. Uh, the smart investors will be patient. They'll understand your challenges. They'll help you with your challenges. The investors who don't understand your industry uh, will always be pushing you to go to market fast. They won't understand why you're spending a lot of money on clinical trials and they'll be impatient. And then they make future fundraising difficult for you because they you know, might put up walls for uh, future rounds and so on. So these are my, um, these are my close, you know, things that are uh, top of mind for me at the moment uh, and advice that I have. So, okay, so that's it. That's my presentation. Uh, I'm sure people, there are a lot of questions potentially. Uh, so happy to answer some. Thank you, Dr. Ingram, for sharing your amazing experience. As a PhD student myself, uh, it's inspirational to hear you, your startup company was born out of your post-grad studies and how quickly you've developed the Axim uh, home device and your Axim neurotechnology business is quite amazing. Thank well, you. Next up, no worries. Next up, we have uh, Prof. Milos Popovic. Uh, Prof. Milos is the director of CART Research Institute at the Toronto Rehabilitation Institute, University Health Network. He is also a professor in the Institute of Biomedical Engineering at the University of Toronto. Dr. Popovich is a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Engineering and a fellow of the American Institute of Medical and Biological Engineering. He is also the co-founder and director of uh, MindTech Company the Center for Advancing Neurotechnological Innovation to Application, also known as CRANIA, the CRANIA Neuromodulation Institute at the University of Toronto, and the Canadian Spinal Cord Injury Rehabilitation Association. Dr. Popovich is also the founder of Fabric-Based Research Platform and the Rehabilitation Engineering Laboratory, both located at the Kite Research Institute. Dr. Bobovich held the Toronto Rehab Chair in Spinal Cord Injury Research Appointment from 2007 to 2017. When he's not working, Professor Bobovich enjoys hiking and walking his dogs. Over to you, Prof. Bobovich. It's difficult to talk when you're muted. So thank you, Ashra, <laughs> for your kind introduction. It's, um, very nice. Tony, you did a great job. Uh, uh, he hit all the right points. So uh, I'll try to cover some other things. So we, 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 you, you get more out of the, the time you have with two of us. So I'll tell you about the Mind Move uh, uh, product. So before we do that, uh, you need to know that I have a conflict of interest. 
Uh, and if I don't declare that, my hospital is going to get me in trouble. So anyway, I, I created a company. It's called MindTech. Uh, it's, uh, and I'm a shareholder in the company and whatnot. So MindMove. Uh, MindMove is actually a functional electrical stimulation system. What does that mean? That means that you have a device which pro produces electrical pulses. They're really low energy, tiny little pulses, which can't do much. But if they're applied to your peripheral nerves, they will generate muscle contractions. And if you time them properly and you control them well, you can get all kinds of different uh, movements done in the body. Some of them can be gross motor, things like locomotion, and some of them can be fine motor control, like grasping and whatnot. And we have decided to do the grasping and reaching in stroke patients and spinal cord injury patients and, and such, because that's one of the major deficit in, in, in this patient population. And if they don't have a functional arm and hand, they cannot return back to their normal activities. And um, if you cannot do things independently, you depend on others. So attendant care and everything else uh, makes um, living more complicated and cost of living uh, is way much higher. So how does it work? Or originally, electrical stimulation was envisioned as a tool to kind of be used as an assistive device. And we originally started in that space, but very soon discovered that actually, if you apply electrical stimulation as a training tool, you can actually take somebody who is fully paralyzed, can move the hand or has a tone, and by applying electrical stimulation, you should be able to um, restore the voluntary function in this patient population. Did you lose me for a minute or everything was working okay? Okay, good, because on my side, it started behaving funny. So what you can do is you can take a person who cannot, for example, reach and grasp an object at all. You can apply electrodes to all the muscles which are relevant for that task. And you can artificially create that movement and patient will pick an object and retrieve it. As long as the patient is cognitively active in this and is trying to perform the task as you're delivering electrical stimulation, within a number of sessions, slowly they start restoring their uh, brain function and spinal cord injury function and their spinal cord function, and they're able to do the task independently. Let me just roll my, my shades because otherwise I'm going to look like an angel and I, I'm not one. The sun just came out in Toronto. Sorry about that. Okay, so what can you do? You can do really complicated tasks like extending, reaching and grasping an object. You can do fine motor control like tripod grass, lumbrical grass, key grass. We can even do by manual. So you can have half of the channels on one arm and half of the channels on the other arm. And the person can lift the train and do all kinds of different things. So that's what the device is all about. And what is exciting about the device, device has been on the market for some time and actually is doing the job it's just supposed to do. But what is exciting, and that's why we're here today, is uh, the journey, right? So this is the journey. A little bit crazy. Starts over in 1997 and goes up today. Uh, it's still ongoing. So in 1997, we started the journey by building an electrical stimulator. Why would you build an electrical stimulator? Well, there's a buckets of them. You can go to today on you know eBay and buy them for you know 100 bucks or Amazon. Because every stimulator that you buy or you could buy at that time was either designed for one thing in particular, to treat one particular pathology, like a drop foot or something else. And there was no flexibility. That was number one thing. And second thing is the quality of stimulation and control was pathetic. It doesn't matter if it was implanted or it was surface, it was really poor. So I, my buddy Thierry and I, we decided, oh, let's go and build a platform that you can use as a neuroprosthetic system to deliver any type of electrical stimulation. So this thing could be used as a pacemaker, it can be used as a deep brain stimulator, but we have used it as a system to help people stand, walk, sit, grasp, 
rich and whatnot. So we spent a lot of time building this. It took us about four or five years to figure out how to do it and do it really well. And then we started applying it to the patients. And originally we wanted to apply it as a technology, as assistive technology, because in 1997, neuroplasticity <laughs> didn't exist according to neurology books and uh, what you call it. So we've been building assistive technology device. But then as we were playing with patients and doing things with them with the device, some patients start re recovering and we learned that actually this technology can reprogram the brain, can reprogram the spinal cord, and it can create a new pathways. So the person who was paralyzed yesterday, today is able to go rich and grasp objects. So that was kind of aha moment for us. Then once we figured that out and we uh, programmed the device to do this task, we went through various clinical trials. And this takes a lot of time, right? First, there are single patients, then we have a, a phase one clinical trials, and then we went to the phase two clinical trials with spinal cord injury patients and stroke patients. And as you can see, this is eating a lot of time, almost 2011. And uh, by the time we finished with stroke and spinal cord injury patients, and we had really amazing data, and we were very proud of it, then we thought, oh, we're going to start the company. So we created a company. And guess what? Nothing happens, right? Because as Tony told you, if you don't have a good business model, nothing happens. And we had a problem putting a business model together. We thought that our business model makes sense, but it didn't apparently. So it took us quite some time to, to figure that out. And what helped really was we went to some competition. We did reasonably well at the competition, but nothing spectacular. And then I met Diana Plura, who Tony knows. And I had with Diana those Kung Fu Panda moment, which she says, you know, when you think about Kung Fu, you suck. But when you think about cookies, you're really good at that. And so we came up with a business plan. Um, primarily, she was the one who helped us do this. And we started a company. And she was the first CEO of the company. Uh, we secured the funding and created a proper company with the proper name, with the proper branding, and you raise the money. Money is important. That was a, one of the largest uh, angel investment in 2012. It's about 2 million bucks at the time. And then we went through, you know, building the device, uh, because that what we had was a prototype. We cannot get a Health Canada approval for that. So we had to build a whole new device get Health Canada approval in 2014. In 2015, we launched the product. And dealing with environment, with people, with healthcare system. And in the meantime, we went for FDA approval, got FDA approval and launched the product in Michigan. Why Michigan of all the different states? Because we had partners there, which were very good. And we then we launched the product in the US. Now it's in different locations, but that's how we started it. We had multiple change managements, multiple engineers came and left. As you go through different phases of the company, different skills are needed. So the people with whom you start your journey may not be the people with whom you are at this stage of the journey, or you may not be with them on the next stage of the journey. So you have to be prepared for that. Uh, not always the pleasant thing because you love the people, you're emotionally attached to them, and then you have to tell them, you know, we need to put another person in your place, right? Uh, we had the initial public offering this year in February, March, and there is more to come because we're building now systems for locomotion and other things that uh, company wants to do. So that was, that's the journey. I, um, I'd rather answer the questions because I think there's more excitement in that. It's um, so one thing before I stop is this type of thing, doing this type of thing is really excellent for um, ruining your marriage, you know, because it's so intense. You have your day job, then you do your night job, which is this. It's insane. And you need to have a partner who can tolerate that. We've been in this business, my wife and I, for about 20 years. A business meaning she tolerates me and I'm being ridiculously doing this for the last uh, 20 years. We didn't make any money out of it, okay, yet. 
The only thing which is exciting is probably about 1,000 patients got the stimulator and they get treated and 1,000 patients are not able to use, to their, use their heads. Hopefully, and now we're working with Fury Intelligence and their marketing team and their team of physiotherapists and occupational therapists, which are outstanding. And hopefully this partnership with other things will further move technology into you know, Far East, further in US and in Europe. And hopefully it, it is going to happen. This is a 25 year journey and we are not yet there. This is just for Tony to, to give him a heart attack. So this takes time, right? I look like Tony, look at me like now. So that's, uh, that's how that looks like, okay? And this is the institution who actually pays my salary while I'm enjoying this journey, right? Good. Well, thank you, Milos, so much for that, um, for sharing all of that experience. And I think your presentation to me really highlights that uh, starting the business is definitely a marathon and not a sprint. Uh, what a 25 years you have had. Uh, I think one thing is on behalf of all the clinicians and the patients out there that have now you know, benefited from your technology. Uh, thank you for all your hard work and perseverance. Uh, of uh, all those years and finally having something that can be kind of translated into the clinical settings, really exciting. So uh, from the outside looking in, it's definitely worth it, but uh, I'm sure there's a few gray hairs out of the experience. But <laughs> now we're, we'll probably shift gears to um, the questions. I think we, we have a, some really good time here to uh, address um, some great discussion points that have already come through online. Um, Tony and Milosh have, have busily been trying to answer some of them already typing, but we might kind of um, shift to, to answering some of them live now. Um, and as Ash will probably point out in a little bit, if we don't get to them live, then we'll, we'll try and address them um, in other avenues. So I think the one of the first questions um, I would kind of, and there's so many good ones to, to, uh, to look at, but um, one maybe for, for both presenters. Um, let's see, I think one of you actually already answered it um, in writing. Uh, let's see, was, was more about, um, have you actually taken kind of any business courses before you, you started and, and would you kind of recommend that? I know you mentioned Milosh that you, you brought on an expert, but yourself, you know, would you recommend people actually going down and trying to kind of build up your, your skills in business as on top of all the research and other things that people you were juggling at the time? Oh, it's a it's a it's a really good question. One thing which you have to which one has to recognize that we don't have all the skills that's necessary to do this. And learning how to put a business plan and you do it yourself, you're eating time. Meaning that you're trying to develop the skill of a business person. Well, you're an expert in technology development or expert in physiotherapy or in dance, whatever your business may be. So now if you stop that and you start focusing on becoming a business person that can be you know, that takes time and every day or year that you burn building your skills removes you from getting the goal done the best thing you can do is in my opinion and i may be wrong and tony will correct me maybe is get somebody who is actually has the skills has done that before and work with them and while you're working with them you learn those skills I have done it with Diana and other people. And through osmosis of watching what they're doing, how they're thinking, you get a sense of what makes sense. And what is also very important, if this technology is unique and exciting and new, the path is not obvious, okay? Because you're not designing something that's been done in like bagels. We know how to go and sell the bagels, how the shop should look like and how the bakery should look like. You know, you have a neuro, neuroprosthetic system like, Nobody has done it like this before. So you have to figure out and create, invent the business plan. So that requires you and business person and some other people who will give you advice along the journey. So I would not do that, but I will surround myself with the smarter people than I am. And some of them business people, some of them in accounting, some legal, because legal is very important. You have a lot of legal issues. And then you get them all together on the bus and you get going. Yeah, I agree. So, so I actually, so I haven't done that, um, but I often wish I did um, bring on a business person to take that role. So I'm still 
CEO of the company. Um, and it's been fine. <laughs> uh, and my investors and my board of directors seem to have confidence in me at this stage. Um, so that's the other thing to think about is, is what are you working on right now, right? Um, and um, what are your what are what's the company's priorities? And are you the right person at the time? I fully expect that maybe at some point I won't be, and, and I'm and I'm totally open to that. And I it doesn't bother me, <laughs> you know. Uh, and and I actually would love to bring someone on to just do it. Um, I haven't met the right person yet. Um, and uh, and I do enjoy what I'm doing, most of it, not all of it, of course. Um, I, uh, but I, but I haven't met the right person. And and so one thing, and and um, Dr. Povich, maybe you can. Uh, I, I'd like to know your opinion on this. So I often meet uh, business people uh, who, at first, seem like they might be relevant, right? Um, but then, you know, when you start talking to them, they have all these crazy ideas, and you, as the expert in your technology, know we can't do that or <laughs> or that's not a good fit or so if you bring someone on like that you have to make sure that they take their time to understand the technology and that uh you are still involved you know in some of the big decisions right um like you should still have uh, you know you bring on a ceo you should be you should remain the chief technical or chief scientific officer you you know you should remain at a leadership position because the business person uh could you know, if, if you're not careful, can take the company in some crazy directions that aren't really a good fit. Um, and you would know that, right? Um, now, uh, but there's a balance there, right? Because you can also be wrong about what good business opportunities look like. Um, so it's really tricky. Like I said, I haven't done it yet, but I'm open to and often wish I I I, I had early, but I am, you know, I'm where I am now. So, <laughs> oh, and the business courses thing. So I took one course uh in entrepreneurship at the business school when i was in my phd and uh that was and then i just started going to accelerators the advice i got from people was that business courses teach you how to manage companies not necessarily how to start them um and so don't don't worry about it too much and when you do need that kind of expertise you can probably bring someone on board the team um, so that was the advice I got. I don't know if that's the best advice, but that's what I was told. So, um, also compatibility that yeah. person has to be compatible with you. I mean, they can be smart, but if you're not on a safe wavelength, it's not going to work. And, um, mm -hmm. sometimes you don't need brilliant people. You just need nice people. Yeah. And that Very goes valuable. way <laughs> further than having brilliant people for unmanageable, right? Yeah, it's true. I agree with that. Um, I'm looking at some of the questions here. Um, I was going to say, oh. there's lots, lots of good ones there. So yeah, I think are. one one in particular that uh, stood out to me was just thinking about um you know, at what point do you consider being acquired by another company? That's the other thing. It's, you know, it's a long journey. And, you know, when, when do you say, oh, look, I'm ready to, to handball? Uh, <laughs> the other part of that question is um, thinking about the smart investor that they, they, they asked, um, or if asked if they should be within the healthcare space or just have good market exposure. Because I know that they're, you can, can have I take that one? Of yeah, I was going to say. Can I take can. that question? Okay. So, just, not my not my personal experience, but I used to work with a Swiss company which had beautiful FES systems in 90s, late 90s. Outstanding. And then there's a big company which came and suggested they're going to acquire them or integrate them. And they did that and they killed the company. They didn't kill it because they wanted to kill the company. They killed it because they had no skill set, like Tony said a few minutes ago. Mm. So that can be, you know, kiss of death. So one has to be extremely careful, right? Depends. Or if you just want to cash in, okay? If, if the idea was I started a company, I created some buzz around it, and I cash in X amount of money, right? Then fine, if you don't care what is the end product. But I cared. I mean, we created a therapy which we know changes the life of patients. So... It, you know, original motivation was not the money. The original motivation is tomorrow when I have a stroke because of running the company for 20 years, 
you know, yeah. I want to have a therapy that is ready for me, right? And uh, so you have to see what is your motivation. Yeah, and and anything you'd add to that, Tony? I don't. No, I agree. Um, it's sort of the scary thing about an acquisition is that seeing your vision fall apart. Yeah. Um, and there's a real risk that that can happen. But at the same time, when you raise money from investors, you make almost this implicit uh, deal that that's maybe on the horizon. That's how they get their money. Uh, although you could go, you know, you could I IPO and go public. And, and that's another way that they, they can liquidate their investment and take their gains. So that's another way to go. And I find that attractive to think about. It really just depends, like I'm, it really depends um, on so many things. So, you know, if, if, an, if an opportunity came by and it seemed like um, the company that would acquire the, us, um, it would help us grow um, then and, and get out, you know, like, so you could, you know, use their resources and their money to get your product to more people, more patients and, and get it out there. That sounds great. And that's sort of what they want to do. And that's how they make money from acquiring you. So I think, uh, you know, I would be really wary unless things were going really terribly. <laughs> if it looked like, you know, we're not going anywhere ourselves, then you can, you can look at um, the kind of acquisition where, you know, they're just buying your intellectual property and your team. And then they're going to, you know, basically, like you said, they, they might on purpose kill your company and just take, take your assets and right. Um, so that's a sad way to go. I don't want that. And, um, and then, yeah, so, so, so yeah, it's really complicated. You really got to look at the situation. Uh, and I, and I think about this a lot because again, like I said, this sort of, um, this sort of deal with investors that there's an expectation that I bring the company to that stage. Uh, but there are ways that you can do that and still continue being in a leadership position and you, you know, and, and, and so, so I think it's something you, you can navigate it really well and have your cake and eat it too. I don't think it's easy. <laughs> um, so anyway, but that's what I'm going to try. That's what I'm going to try to do. So you can imagine being acquired by a big company, but you stay on as the vice president of this department, which is your company, right? Um, something like that. And, and they, they often will want you to do that because they need your expertise, right? For a while. So uh, yeah, so there's ways of doing it. Uh, I'm told I'm certainly not even close to getting there, um, I don't think. Uh, and what Dr. Popovich said about the timelines. <laughs> so, you know, I'm five years in and uh, I fully expect it at least to be 10 years before I'm thinking about stuff like that. Uh, and maybe it'll be longer. <laughs> probably, probably will be longer. Um, so yeah, so that's just how it, that's just how it's going to go. So I don't think I have to worry too much. I think about it, but I don't think I have to worry about it too much right now. If, if that's maybe not a satisfying answer, but that's the answer. <laughs> Great answer, Tony. And, uh, I have a question for both of you. Uh, so the question is what was a key challenge that you've encountered during starting your company and what helped you to overcome that challenge? Do you want me to go? I'll go first this time. <laughs> so uh, uh, there were lots of key challenges. It feels like everything's a key challenge. But I think uh, early when we first started, um, and another person asked about building a prototype. So I actually did want to comment on that. Um, uh, is it essential to build a prototype first because sometimes it's expensive? Uh, small uh, small funds for making prototypes. So yeah, I mean, so when you're early. Um, as we've already discussed and say you don't have this magical, believable business plan and all you have is sort of your expertise, it helps a lot to get a prototype as early as possible because it shows potential funders like grants and investors that you can do you can do things, right? You can actually execute and build things. It's it's proof, right? It's, again, it's, it's going past the idea stage. And if you're a technical founder, uh, like if, if you're coming from the from that side and you're not sort of the business founder, you're a technical founder, that's sort of all you have. And, and I think you should do it. So I think you should get a prototype right away. And then that sort of gives you some proof of concept. Uh, and that's how you can attract money. So yeah, you have to, so that is, I would say that answers the other question of, you know, what was some of the key challenges? So that was a real challenging thing in, in early when we first started, because 
Chris and I were, were academics on the neuroscience and rehab side, but we were not engineers. So, you know, we had to build something and, and prove that we could do it. So yes, we did find some really small grant money um, um, that didn't require us to also have, you know, revenue or investor money. And it's hard to get that kind of grant money. So, so, but we did manage to get a little bit like $10,000, $20,000. And that was enough though, to consult with some engineers and say, Hey, can you build this for us? You know, or whatever it is that, that you can't do. Uh, and we got something working barely. Uh, it didn't work the way we wanted it to, but it was enough. Then from there, it opened up other financing options. So, th so that was the tricky part at the beginning, at the very, very beginning. Then the other hard stuff, I think, is like hiring your first few people. We actually had to fire our first two people that we ever hired because we were we just didn't hire the right people. <laughs> and firing people really is awful. It's an awful experience. Um, so, you know, um, learning how to build a team is tricky, too. Uh, that's after the, that first prototype phase. Um, so those are the big key challenges. And then it's then it's financing. And it still is, you know, it still is getting investors still still a challenge. Thank you, Tony. Would you like to add anything, Prof. Popovich? Sure. Uh, technical problems, I mean, I'm speaking from the, the side of an engineer, they're surmountable. You may not solve them perfectly, but they're surmountable. Uh, people problem are the biggest one. You get a wrong investor, she or he wants to dictate what you are supposed to do, messes up your space, big problem. You have a CEO who doesn't get what's going on. It's a big problem. So people problems are actually the biggest problems. So choose yeah. your partners as if, you, as if you plan to marry them, right? And uh, I cannot stress how important it is to find the right people, right? And um, you'll be surprised. I think you've touched on that. Thanks, uh, Prof. Popovich. But one of the questions was about what are the criteria to find a, a good co-founder or how do you find your co-founders? I mean, co-founder co you know, co -founder is your buddy with whom you have designed technology and you're very excited when you were doing that or you build the first prototype or something like that. Uh, look at Steve Jobs and his co-founder, right? His co-founder didn't continue on the journey because the journey is brutal and your co-founder may not have intestinal fortitude to continue the journey. You know, they, they were smart to help you build a prototype and have a vision. But then when ugly things start happening and bullets start flying left and right, right? You, and you have to duck and you, you get, you know, wounds here and there. Not everybody likes that. This, starting a company is not for faint of heart. It, it, this is not something you in, get into there because it's cute to do, you know? P playing pool and dancing is cute to do. Starting a company, you essentially enlist yourself, you sign for pain and suffering <clears throat> with high probability of not getting this done because in the first year, most of the companies fail. Nine out of 10 fail in the year one. And then, you know, usually companies which are amazing and very successful, you look a little bit and they just popped out on a, on a scene and you're excited to look at them. When you scrape a little bit of surface, you find out they've been there for 20 years, struggling to get their business model and, 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 um, and payment structures and billing structures and delivery figured out because it's not easy, <clears throat> right? So nothing happens overnight. It's hard work and you need a lot of competent and talented people around you to get it going, especially if something new and exciting and different and nobody has done. Like what Tony is doing, it's very unique, very exciting. And I congratulate him what, what he's doing, where he's going, but this is not easy, right? So for him to come up with a proper business model and how to charge people and how to get this in everybody's home or clinic, will have challenges as we had challenges. So, person who is not ready to deal with these challenges should be very careful or should be ready to give it to the, the other co-founder who has 
you know, intestinal fortitude to push this to the next level. And step aside, right? Oh, thank you. Thank you for answering that. I think uh, we're running out of time a little bit here, so I'll, I'll pass back to uh, to Ash to finish up. So, uh, th thank you so much. Thanks, Prof. Uh, Popovich, and thank you, Dr. Ingram, uh, for answering and sharing your insights in starting your own business for your rehabilitation technology research. I believe, yes, as Taya said, we are almost out of time. Uh, thanks for your questions, and if you have any further, please email us at the address listed in the chat and we will work in, on providing uh, answers. Great, yeah. thank you for having us. I really yeah, appreciate th that. Thanks so much. Thank yeah, so I know Milosh, uh, you, you might have to head off for another engagement, but I just wanted to thank again yourself and Tony and of course our audience uh, for your time and attention. And we really hope that you've uh, enjoyed the session and learned from our experts. I definitely have found it very uh, very inspiring for sure. And um, I'd like just to bring your attention, of course, to the poster now listed on your screen and in the chat box, there's some additional details that you might want to list down in case you have those questions. And um, there's a link there also to the registration for our next webinar. And uh, that one's the market access. Um, as Tony mentioned, it's a really key part of starting your own business. So we highly encourage you to register. It's, it's called market access from analysis to reimbursement and adoption. So there's going to be lots of really uh, valuable and equally as interesting uh, session coming up. Uh, but for now, I'd like to just say goodbye and, and stay safe. And we really look forward to seeing you online again uh, for our next webinar. Thank you, everyone. Really good question. Thank you.